In the naked city, a man dies and is reborn with alternate beats of his heart. One instant, blood and oxygen pulse to his brain, and he is truly alive. Then there is nothing, and his brain sleeps, until a new succeeding heartbeat recharges it. Thus, a man is the residue of a billion deaths and a billion reawakenings. A coral reef of thoughts and experiences, layer upon layer of scar tissue, a complex of sifting, evolving personalities, so that at any given moment he is no more, no less, than the sum of a succession of heartbeats. This is a story of people pinned to one moment in time. Some of them change for the better, some for the worse. Some of them even die, not just until the next heartbeat, but forever. on a launching pad long enough, sooner or later, somebody's going to launch you. Somebody like a husband? Could be. A father, mother, brother, or even another girlfriend. These were his gals. I wonder if he thought he had enough. It was one too many. Get that started and keep it set for yourself. Right. Now, these girls are all yours, yours and Frank's. As far as I'm concerned, they're all guilty until you prove them innocent. What about the 45 Ejects? What about it? White girl's gonna fire a 45, Mike. Smart girl? Why not? We're covered, Mike. Bedroom? Every angle. Get me set by morning. That front door opens into the right, not to the left. Three entry, three exit. Jack, ballistics got all three of them. The girl, two. Got them both in the five jackets that came in. Looks like a one-gun job, Ed. Mm -hmm. How about the smudging and uh, tattooing? These aren't contact wounds, Mike. The killer stood back and made every shot count. Pretty good shooting. <laughs> Too good. I looked everywhere, Mike. I can't find it. A woman never goes out without a purse. Well, maybe somebody took it. What's a little robbery after a double header like this? Robbery isn't in the picture at all. Harlow's got enough lying around upstairs they would have taken instead. Two grand in a dresser drawer. Don't figure. Well, you just got time to make the last show at the new international club. Hmm? Felicia Reynolds. Who? Harlow's current number one gal. Oh. Don't you read the columns? Oh, come on. I usually have time. Chuck, 
Go out and bring in the guy that heard the shots. Oh, here it is. Felicia Reynolds. It's a plaza number. That's where you start. Then you go back to the A's and straight through the Z's. <laughs> Would you believe it, Mike? He actually has three Z's. Look. Zuleika, Zanita, Zelda. <laughs> City Hall. Come on in, close the door. I think you might find it a little more comfortable out here. Oh, this may sound like a corny line, but I've got nothing to hide. Anyway, the girls would never forgive me if they missed all the gossip. Okay. This might prove a little more embarrassing to you than it will to us. Mm -hmm. Make me blush. Which one of you had supper with her tonight between shows? Look, I love them all dearly, but one thing a girl does not do is have supper with another girl. Miss Reynolds, let's take a point in time, huh? Say 11 o'clock. Where were you between 11 and 11.10 this evening? I had some business. Where? And with whom? That's my business. It's ours now. Look, I had a drink with a friend. End of statement, over and out. Good night, Joe. Look, are you going to get out of here, or does it get into the papers that two cops got fresh with the whole chorus backstage in the dressing room? Miss Reynolds, somebody killed Ben Harlow tonight. Harlow's death, she fainted. Fainted? Yeah. And after we revived her, she still wouldn't budge. Not a word about where she was at 11. Frank's back at the precinct, waiting on the lab report. They ran a paraffin cast to the back of her hand. Remember that missing purse? Yeah. We found it in the back of Harlow's building, in a trash can. Nothing touched as far as we could see. Nothing missing? Why was it taken? We'll have to hang that one up to dry, for the time being. The woman's name is Marta Brent, Mrs. Brent. What about Mr. Brent? In Philly, the convention. The boys picked him up at the airport. They do now. That's why I wanted you here. Brent may have some notions.
Why? Hadn't you better make sure? What time did you talk to her, Mr. Brenton? She said she was going to turn in. I told her I'd be home on Friday. That that's when the convention's over. What time did you talk to her? It was 10. It was just 10, because George said that... George? George Silver, he handles the Southern Territory. George said... Schnook, he said, nobody calls home at 10 o'clock. The smart money waits till 2 or 3 in the morning. You get it? That way you can... I felt like I wanted to belt him. God, he'd been drinking. When I was on the road, I could call home any time from Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, anywhere, and she'd be there. Who was he? This guy, Harlow. Rich, good looking. Plenty of time for playing around. Somebody finally hung a bell on him. Too bad Mrs. Brent had to be there when it started tolling. That's all, Mr. Brent. One of my men will take you home. No. Oh. <laughs> somebody about a murder. Two murders, actually. A man and a woman. His, his name was Ben Arlo. She was Mrs. Marta Brent. I know because I shot them. Sure, she wasn't in the scrub room. You sure she didn't see any of those photographs on the board? As soon as the sergeant called, I went right down, and listened to her story, brought her up to your office, Mike. And you walked in. She'd never been in the squad room, and that's for sure. Okay, Frank. All right, Miss Walden. Where's the gun? I, uh, I threw it in the river, the East River. You know, uh, you look about as guilty as uh, Detective Flint there. What is it? Fight with the boyfriend? Trying to get your name in the papers? Whipping up some sympathy? Miss Walden, we've all had a very long night. And we have a long day ahead of us. There's a lot of things we have to check on. Now, everything you've told us so far, you could easily have heard in the radio. And the things that haven't been broadcast, you don't know anything about. For instance, the caliber of the murder weapon. I told you, I, I don't know anything about calibers. It was just a... Big gun. Yeah, where well, most guns are. Then we asked you about the purse, the lady's purse. You said you didn't remember having seen it even. I just 
Can't seem to remember that part. Young lady, the next time you go into a police station and try to convince people that there, you... There were five shots fired. I, I shot them five times. Him three and her two. Ben came down the stairs from the bedroom. He, he opened the door and I shot him. I came in and, and he fell down. He tried to crawl away and then I felt my finger pull and I heard the second shot. Then, then everything seemed like 10 million miles away. Ben seemed as small as a star and I shot him again. She stood up there on the balcony, and I brought her down, too. She fell down the stairs, and she reached out for me and fell down again. Then she, she got her stole, and I shot her once more. There were, there were two champagne glasses and cigarettes burning, and the hi-fi was playing. Miss Walden. What color was the couch? White. Uh, white with the uh, brown stripes. She could have been in the apartment before, Mike. I've seen the couch on another occasion. Mm. You'd been up there before? Several times. I was Ben. I was one of Ben's girls. I didn't know I was just one of them until later. There's no June Walden here. I know. You know? I asked him about that book. I found it one time in his apartment, and I, I asked him about it. Who are all these girls? He, he told me. He, he told me he collected women. He said that New York was more challenging than Africa. Every day was safari. The great white hunter. He said, he said women are I like wild creatures, just waiting to be caught and tamed. That some are more fragile than birds who'd fly away if you approached them the wrong way. Others were like mice who run off squealing to a dark hole if you didn't set your cheese just so. And others were, were like a lioness. Women who hunted him. Which one were you? Bird? Mouse, or the lioness. I wasn't even in his little black book. You, you still don't believe me, do you? Don't you want to solve this case? Miss Walden, regardless of what you read in the newspapers or see in the movies, we don't always enjoy our job. And we don't always enjoy finding the Ben Harlows of the world or going into an apartment as we did last night. And most of all, we don't enjoy someone like you coming in here and telling us you're guilty. It doesn't give us a sense of triumph, you know. Would you like some coffee? Please. Frank! Yeah. Frank, I want you to get me a stenotypist. Miss Walden wants to make a full confession. Oh, wait a minute, Mike. Hold it a second. Frank, do we still have that gun from the Lang job? Yeah. Do you mind getting it? Not at all. What is this? I just guess I just don't believe him, Mike. Well, what does it take to convince you? Well, some fingerprints for one thing. Of course, we can get those easy enough. Then I think we should have the lab run a dermal nitrate test on it. Thanks, Frank. Miss Walden, I want you to fire this gun. In here? Well, you didn't seem to mind shooting up Harlow's apartment last night. Go ahead. Fire it. This is the kind of a gun you used, huh? No, it, it wasn't this heavy. 
Maybe it was this type. Cylinder. There's a little roller on it. Yes, it it had a roller like that, only it was longer. Uh-huh. You see, Mike? Oh, I didn't have a clip in this, if that's what you're worried about. You don't think I'd let you hand it to her if there had been? Okay, Miss Walden. Out. Goodbye, Miss Walden. Try to explain Miss June Walden to me. I doubt if Miss June Walden can explain Miss June Walden. Frank, she's all yours. You've got all the facts on the case, address, place of employment. For someone who didn't do it, she seems to know as much about the case as any of us. Maybe more. Stay with her, Frank. Yes, sir. Adam, I want you to talk to the wife. Even sick people have moments of clarity. I'll get an okay from downtown. You know, Mike, I'm just wondering how much good this little black book is really gonna do us. Closest we've come to anything yet is Miss Walden. And she isn't even listed. <laughs> Say good morning to Mr. Flint. Good morning, Mr. Flint. Good morning, Lydia. All right, Lydia. You may sit down now. There's a man about 35 years old, nice-looking man, dark eyes and dark hair. He has a mole right here on his forearm and a strawberry birthmark about here on his shoulder. Would you know who that man is? He wears silk shirts with red initials right here. The same initials are on his handkerchiefs. Can you guess what those initials are? This man, Lillian, he married a girl from out of state, a girl from North Dakota. A very nice girl. Her mother and father, they were dead. And they had left her an estate over $2 million. After this man married the girl and got her money, he didn't want the girl anymore. And so he frightened her. He let her believe he was going to hurt her. Lillian? May I hold your hand?
Lillian. What would you do with a man like this? Hide. I'd run away. And I'd hide. Suppose I told you that someone might punish this man. And then he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. But who could punish him? Lillian, suppose I tell you the name of this man. And then you can think. And then maybe you can tell me who might punish him. No. Lillian? No! Who is it that might punish him? Finish, Mr. Flint. Say what you have to say. Lillian? Ben Hollow is dead, Lillian. He's dead and gone forever. I told her. I begged her not to hurt him. Who did you beg not to hurt him? Who did you tell? I'll tell you outside. We'll have to go now. <gasps> Same gun. Are you sure she's home? I know she's here. I followed her home from work. Frank, you know, it might be better if I see her alone. Okay. Yeah, I come in. I just left the hospital, I saw Hollow's wife. They told me someone else had been in to see her about a week ago. You, uh, you told the doctor you were her sister. I, I didn't want to upset her. I, I just had to find out what he'd done to her. I had to be sure. Why? This is a picture taken at the Marquet Club. I'd never been there before. That's a menu I saved from the Dale Inn in Southampton. I'd never tasted such wonderful food. Do you want to see the rest of it? Plain talk, Miss Walden. Just plain talk. never had anything. That's one thing. You work in the steam kitchen all your life and not know any better. But if someone lifts you up, way up, and then lets you down, slams a door in your face, I, I had to know why. Why me? So I went around. I went around to, to see all those other girls, to talk to them find out what he'd done to each of their lives. How they hated him. But then I found out he had a wife in, in a mental ward. I went to see her. That, that's when I knew. I knew I, I had to kill him. With a gun that was too heavy for you to handle? With a gun you couldn't even identify? No, you didn't kill him, Mr. Walden. But you know who did. You're covering up for somebody. Who? Hello? Adam? Yes, Mike, this is Adam. Take this down. The name is Meredith Linus III. 
Just a minute. Got that? Yeah. Suites A and B, sun deck, on the Liberté. Yeah, sailing in 23 minutes. 23 minutes, mm-hmm. Pick them up and bring them in. But Mike, how does all this tie in? We got the murder gun. Yeah. Where did you find it? A gravity pit worker spotted it in a destructor plant on the west side, 56th Street. Saw it just as it was going into the oven. And it's registered to this guy, Linus. Linus, yeah. Now look at him. I want you and Frank to handle him gently. He's got connections. And money he hasn't counted. And if he murdered Harlow, we'll nail him. Right. <laughs> Last night we found a notebook. It had your name in it. It said Kathy Linus, Plaza 52598. That is your number, isn't it? Yes. It wasn't so much a notebook, it was more of a little black book. It belonged to a man that made headlines this morning. I appreciate you have a job to do, gentlemen. Hmm. Please do it and leave. Yeah, well, we'll all be leaving. See the gun that killed Harlow? That was yours. My gun? How could that be? No, Kathy. I didn't kill him. There was a time when I thought I would, but I didn't. Simply because I had enough confidence in you to believe that you'd cut him out of your life yourself in your own good time. When you did, I knew I'd won. I don't suppose you can suggest anything I can tell my guests, some explanation about our not sailing. Well, you're the head of a large company. It's quite possible that Frank and I are uh, two of your employees. Maybe we just came aboard the ship now with some uh, pretty bad news. You have indeed, gentlemen. <laughs> getting to my brain for the last couple hours. You know, when you pass 50, you feel about as strong as a daddy long legs when you haven't had any sleep for, say, when was the last time anybody had any sleep around here? Mike, there's a man downstairs I think you'll have to talk with. You know, to tell you the truth, even though it leaves us with a busted flush, I'm kind of glad Linus cleared himself. That kid is, too. You must be just about catching that boat now. Great inventions, those helicopters. That's what I want to talk to you about, Mike. When he rented that helicopter, he gave me an idea. Like he said, somebody must have broken into his country house at Montauk and taken that gun. <laughs> Even he didn't know it was missing. But who? Sergeant, will you send in George Silver, please? George Silver? Isn't he Andy Brent's alibi from Philadelphia, covering the Southern Territory and who was with Brent at 10 o'clock? That's right. You asked me to check on him, Mike, remember? Yeah. And I did. He was with Brent at 10 o'clock. But, Mike, when I saw Linus get aboard that helicopter, something else struck me. And that's why I took the liberty of having Silver come up. Mr. 
Silver, this is Detective Lieutenant Parker. Have a seat. Greatest gadget since the telephone. Transistor, radio, or glasses. They put it right there at the temple. York's uh, one touchdown behind. Fourth quarter. Mr. Silver, you tell the lieutenant just what you told me, huh? About Andy? Yeah. It's nothing, but your boy here got pretty well worked up when I said it. Look, Andy's a pal of mine, see? You ask me a question, and I'm a boy that gives a straight answer. You said, was I with him at uh, 10 last night in the bar at Long's Hotel in Philly? I say, yeah, I was with him. Oh, no. They fumbled. Who fumbled? We did. Okay, then you asked me if I was with him at 11. I gotta tell you, I don't remember nothing after 10.15. That was the last clock I saw in the hall when Andy helped me drag myself up to my room. I passed out till about two this morning. When you call Andy about his wife. I woke up and he was in pajamas in the other bed. See, we share the same room at the convention. I guess he's crying when you break the news to him. Well, that's it. That's what? Come on, Mike. Can't you see Brent doesn't have an alibi from 10.15 to 2 a.m.? Only a 14-carat alibi. It's a golden cinch he didn't leave Philly at 10.15 and knock off Harlow and New York at 11 the same night. Unless he took a helicopter from door to door, huh? Frank, anything yet? Coming in. Oh, and there's another thing. Tell the lieutenant what company you and Mr. Brent work for. Linus Textile. And you know anything about the Linus Fishing Lodge out at Montauk? Why not? We always have our annual company parties up there. Great place to get away from things. And when was the last party? Just before the convention. We have the party and then the convention. It looks like 30 minutes from Philly by copter, but you got to add 10 minutes from Long's Hotel to the base in Philly, and about five minutes at the West 30th Street heliport across town to Harlow's apartment if you got a car parked and waiting there. That makes it about 45 minutes overall. 45 minutes, huh? Thanks, Frank. Well, that's it, Mike. 45 minutes for him to get here, time to do what he had to do, and 45 minutes to get back. And that's undoubtedly why he hit the girl's purse, so he couldn't make a quick identification. <laughs> Close the door, Mr. Brent, please. Well, who are you? Funny part of it is, you don't even know me, and I was willing to die for you. What is this? What do you want? You're not really bad, are you? That's why I felt what I tried to do was the right thing. I walked around for hours before I knew it was. Look, young lady, I'm busy. I'm very busy. I have a funeral to go to in the morning, and then I'm going to take a trip. So I think you... Can't buy a ticket to take you far enough, Mr. Brent. You loved her very much, didn't you? She was your luck at heaven. And he took it away from you. You ask, who am I? A fellow prisoner, Mr. Brent. A prisoner of hate and anger, a prisoner of what we both did last night. You, in fact, and me in my heart. The two of us. The killers of Ben Harlow and your wife. But that isn't necessary. I've already been to the police and confessed. Not about you, just me. I thought if they take me, then you'd have another chance. I'm nobody, never was. But, but you, you deserved another chance. But they, they didn't believe me. I know now that was wrong. I know now you, you can't live with guilt. We both have to go to the police. I'll stand by you. I'll try to make them understand why you did it. What is this, a joke? I don't know what you're talking about. I went to his apartment last night. I thought if he couldn't make me understand why... why he was the way he was, I, I'd have to hit him with something. Those... those big brass fire tongs, you know. But he only... he only laughed at me in front of your wife. Then he 
took her upstairs and he called from the balcony, don't slam the door when you go. I stood there, I, I don't know how long. And then the bell rang. There was something about the way it rang that frightened me. And I hid behind the drapes. I saw Ben come out, down the stairs, open the door. I saw it all. I saw the tears on your cheeks when you hit her. Your hand shook when you saw her fall. And she held the fur out to you. She wanted that fur more than anything else in the world. That damn mink. I'm still making the payments on it. And I killed it. How do you like that? I killed her and I still haven't paid for it yet. What am I going to do with you? I've got to leave. I can't leave you here. I can't take you with me either. Hello, Mike. Adam. Listen, we're at his place now, but he's gone. He just left. Oh, and there's a girl with him. And from the description, it could be June Walden. And another thing, he's driving a 60 convertible Chevy. Yeah, license plate 4X3675. No mistake about the ID? No, the helicopter pilot made a positive identification of Brent's picture. Right. Higgins, get the CB on the direct line. General alarm. <laughs> I just missed. Always one step short of success. Not so much a failure as a, as a non-success. You can learn to live with failure, most people do. It's a lot of rougher living with non-success. Marta, the most beautiful woman in the world. She was my one success. That's why she destroyed me when she let that man. Car 19 to Central K. Proceed, car 19. Response to signal 31. Blue Chevrolet Convertible, license 4X3675. Moving north, 1st Avenue, at 39th Street. Traveling high speed. Turning at 42nd Street. Let's go with that one.
I don't even know your name. Adam Flint, Andrew Bates. Closer at this moment than blood brothers, yet separated forever by a moment in time. And five shots from a Colt automatic. Andrew Bates is not simply good or bad, but something else, something in between. A changing residue of the scars left by every passing moment, every single experience. For all men are no more than the sum of their time and at any point within it are merely the subtotal of a succession of heartbeats. There are eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. Screen Gems film presentation from Columbia Pictures, produced by Herbert B. Leonard.